Okay, we're happy to have uh, Kira Goldner tell us about optimal mechanism design for single-minded agents. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is Right Work with Nikhil Devener, Raghavan Saxena, Ariel Schwartzman, and Matt Weinberg. So one of the most fundamental problems in algorithmic game theory is how can a seller maximize her revenue? Say we have a seller who has an apple and an orange for sale, and we have some buyer who comes along, she has some value for each item, say $7 for the apple, $5 for the orange, and these are her private information, so the seller does not know them. However, they're drawn from some prior distribution, which is known to the seller. And the question is, what mechanism, some truthful mechanism, should the, the seller use to maximize her expected revenue with respect to the prior distribution? Now, if the seller is only selling an apple, then this is completely resolved from Meyerson 1981. And there's just some price that she should post with respect to the distribution in order to get the maximum revenue. But as soon as we have an apple and an orange, things get very complex and we still don't know how to solve this. So this is a core open problem in algorithmic game theory. How do we optimally maximize revenue beyond just one item or one parameter for the buyer? Okay, so what happens when we go from one to two items? When we only have one item, everything is simple, it's easy to compute, and there's only one real option for the buyer. She can pay the price and take the item, or she doesn't participate. But as soon as we go to two items, it's intractable to compute, there are uncountably infinite options offered to the buyer. There could be one lottery ticket that she buys for different probabilities to get the apple and the orange, and then there could be just a slightly different lottery ticket for a slightly different price, and thus we could have uncountably infinite options for these different lottery tickets. And we still know very little about how to find the optimal mechanism. And there's a huge gap between how to sell just one item and how to sell two different items. And so what remains an open problem is what optimal mechanisms can we characterize? What settings beyond one item are tractable? Now, many, many people have tried to study this question over the years, and there is a lot of brilliant work here, but still essentially no multi-parameter settings where we have general optimal mechanisms that are known without restrictions on the distribution. That doesn't mean there's not a lot of really, really brilliant work in the top econ journals, in EC, et cetera. So let me tell you about some of that work, but still none of it is general or without restrictions. So there's been two major lines of work. One is in the restricted setting. So for example, two parameters, each of them uniform zero one with quadratic utility. So notice how specific this is. So we have many specific restricted settings where we've been able to characterize the optimal distributions, or we come up with specific mechanisms that we really like, for example, selling the grand bundle, and we characterize under what conditions is that the optimal mechanism. A third line of work has been saying, in polynomial time, we could produce the optimal mechanism, but it's not a characterization, it's not a constructive result. So we have many great results on trying to find optimal mechanisms, but none of them are general, constructive, without restriction. Recently, in the past four years or so, there's been a bunch of work trying to study the space in between one item and two items, and hitting this sweet spot that's sort of at the threshold of tractability. So there's been a little bit of work here in this interdimensional setting between single dimensional and multidimensional. And I will get into this at the very end of the talk um, to contextualize the new work. But what I'm going to focus on in this talk is the single-minded setting and also a little bit the multi-unit pricing setting. And I'm also going to talk about by what metrics are they in between one item and two items. So what is the single-minded setting? The single-minded setting is where a buyer has some bundle that they want. Um, it could be Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi plus phone or Wi-Fi plus TV, but they want some specific bundle and they're happy as long as they get some set that contains that bundle and they're unhappy if they don't. And they have a value for how much getting that bundle is worth to them. So for example, if somebody wants Wi-Fi, they're happy and they get their value as long as they get Wi-Fi. So getting phone is worth no extra to them, they just want Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi and phone is worth just the same, Wi-Fi and TV is worth just the same. However, if they want Wi-Fi and phone, they're only happy here getting Wi-Fi and phone because Wi-Fi and TV does not contain Wi-Fi and phone. Um, their value and bundle is drawn from some joint prior distribution known to the seller. And notice here that there is some ordering on how good the different bundles are because Wi-Fi and phone contains Wi-Fi and therefore it is better in some sense than Wi-Fi. However, Wi-Fi and phone is not comparable 
to Wi-Fi and TV because neither one contains the other. So they are incomparable. So here we have a partial ordering. And notice that this contrasts to earlier work on the FedEx setting where there are deadlines of one day shipping, two day shipping, three day shipping. A customer just has a deadline when they want their package by and the shipping options are totally ordered in some sense because getting your package within one day is strictly better than two days and everything is totally ordered. So this setting is partially ordered and thus more general than the FedEx setting, which is totally ordered. Okay, so what do we do in our work? Well, first we have some special cases. The first special case is when the partial ordering in the DAG that represents it has out degree at most one. And here the FedEx solution just applies. Even though it's a partial ordering, if we have out degree at most one, then it turns out that we can show that the FedEx solution of Fiat et al applies. The second special case is under the condition called DMR. DMR is declining marginal revenues, and I'll talk about it more later, but the high level concept is that if you look at the revenue curve in value space, not quantile space is what we're probably used to from Meyerson, it's, this is concave, this means DMR. Um, I've written what it means technically here. It means that the Meyerson virtual value times the density function is increasing. And in this special case, then we're able to come up with an algorithmic characterization for the dual variables. It's sort of like a greedy flow-based algorithm and we can give a algorithmic characterization. And here the optimal mechanism is deterministic. So we solve this explicitly under an algorithmic characterization. In the general case, our, our characterization is much, much less clear. I'll talk about it later, but it's via dual properties. And it is not deterministic whatsoever. In fact, the menu complexity is unbounded. There are unbounded many options offered to the buyer. However, it's still finite. And so what does unbounded mean? It means that for any M, there exists some buyer distribution over the value and bundle pairs, such that the optimal mechanism offers at least M different options to the buyer. And so this is what I'm going to dig into for the rest of the talk. Okay, so now it's going to get a bit technical, but I don't wanna dig into all the crazy duality machinery. So I'm gonna try and just use the bare minimum and hopefully it'll be understandable. So what we do is we formulate some optimization problem and we take the dual and now I'm just going to explain the bare minimum of what we use in duality. So here is our objective function um, and our constraints. And our constraints correspond to some truthfulness constraints saying that the buyer should prefer to port their bundle over any other bundle and their value over any other value. Okay. And there are dual variables corresponding to each constraint. And now I want to talk about some complementary slackness conditions and how we represent them pictorially because what's going to constrain us is the complementary slackness conditions that say that this has to be optimal. And that's what's going to force our hand with respect to the menu complexity. So first we should notice up here that we have this, oh, my mouse stopped working, okay. We have this, uh, fee variable, okay? If this fee variable is positive, then in order for A to maximize this quantity, then A better be one. A is between zero and one. That's how it's constrained to be feasible. So if phi is positive, then A better be one, okay? If B is negative, then for A to maximize this quantity, A better be zero. And otherwise, if phi is zero, then A can be whatever it wants to be in between, okay? So that's our first constraint. If phi is positive, A is one. If phi is negative, A is zero. Our second constraint is complementary slackness, which says that either the, very, the dual variables are zero or the constraints are tight. So this says if lambda is positive, then the constraint better be tight. What does it mean for this constraint to be tight? It means that the allocation has to be constant. Okay, and so here I'm just corresponding to what it means pictorially. If we see a positive sign, it means the allocation has to be one. If we see a negative sign, the allocation has to be zero. If we see this oval, it means that lambda is positive and therefore the allocation must be constant. Okay, this next one is tricky. What we have here is if, if this uh, alpha constraint is is if this alpha variable is positive, then this constraint here must be tight. What does it mean for this constraint to be tight? What does it mean for the area to be tight here? Well, it means that the, the utility between A and C is tight. A and C are equally preferable to someone of type C, 
if someone of type C finds A and C equally preferable, it means that somebody of type C finds A at least as preferable as type B because somebody of type C needs to prefer type C to B because C dominates B, okay? And so what that means is that A needs to be at least as preferable to B or that there needs to be at least as much area under A than B because uh, utility and area under the curve are the same, okay? And so if we see an arrow going into A, it means that there needs to be at least as much area under the allocation curve of A as there is a B. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to come up with the key idea for the lower bound. First, we're going to start at this point, X1 in B, and it's positive here. So the allocation rule at X1, because of its positive, needs to be one. Now we're going to look at X1 in A, and because there is this arrow into it, it needs to be this, it needs to be at least as preferable as B, and therefore to be at least as preferable as something with an allocation rule of one, it must be non-zero. To match the utility here of something that has an allocation rule of one, it needs to have an allocation that's non-zero. Now we look at the allocation rule down here. The allocation rule at our lower A is in the same oval as A of X1, and the allocation is constant in this oval. Therefore, the allocation down here must also be non-zero. Now we're going to look over at the allocation rule at X2. Well, the allocation rule at X2 and A is the same in this whole oval, which we know is non-zero, and therefore to match utility of the allocation rule at X2 and B, it must also be non-zero because they have to be equally preferable. Okay, and now these are in the same oval. So down here, the allocation rule also has to be non-zero. So we've argued our way all the way down using these three complementary slackness conditions that everything needs to be non-zero. So now we fix the allocation rule at our lower B, whatever it might be. And we say, okay, let's focus back on X2 and A. What is the allocation rule at our lower A? We know that a needs to be at least as preferable, so it needs to have at least as much area under the curve. If it were to be the same allocation rule at these two points, it would not have at least as much area under the curve. It would have less area under the curve. Therefore, it needs to be a strictly larger allocation rule, so it needs to be distinct. And so what we did was we argued our way down that they were all non-zero, and then we started arguing back up that it needed to be distinct. And so what we do is we continue that argument, arguing down that they need to all be non-zero, and then arguing back up that they all need to be strictly increasing and therefore all distinct. And so what that leads us with is saying that there are M different allocations that are all distinct and therefore there are M different options offered to the buyer. Okay, so that's where we get our lower bound. For any M you give me, I can come up with this type of gadget that says that there need to be M different options offered to the buyer. Now, what I didn't tell you is why there is some distribution that admits a dual like this. I just talked in terms of what the dual looks like, but I didn't talk in terms of what the buyer distribution is. The, thing, the other thing that we do is we come up with this master theorem that basically says, you can just work with the fun dual part, we'll deal with the messy distribution part for you. And it says that any dual that's just given in terms of signs and non-negative variables has some distribution that admits it. So we did all the messy part with the distributions. The dual exists, okay? That's what the master theorem says. Finally, I told you that it's always finite, even though it's unbounded. This is just for the three item case. And here's a cute argument why. So this algorithm said that the menu complexity was the length of the sequence of x1, x2, x3 down to m. Why can't it be infinite? If it were infinite, it's a bounded and monotone sequence, and this converges to some point x star, and we could just set that price. So it aborts and it doesn't turn out to be infinite, and it turns out to just be a single price. Let me make my pointer. Okay, so let me wrap up and contextualize this and all the other work. We have the spectrum of the number of distinct outcomes or menu complexity going from one for one item to uncountably infinite for two items. FedEx. Uh, by Fiat et al. Um, was coming in at exponential, proved to be tight by Saxena, Schwarzman, and Weinberg. And then budgets, which was studied by Devener and Weinberg in EP17, was also shown to be exponential. What we showed was that the single-minded problem is unbounded, but for the three-item case, the three-bundle case, uh, 
finite. And we also extend our lower bound of unbounded that I just showed you to the multi-unit pricing problem as well. Finally, we introduce another setting called coordinated valuations, which is just a little bit more complex and show that it comes in at countably infinite to show the distinct spectrum going from one to uncountably infinite. So we really fill out the spectrum here. In addition, we have another metric other than menu complexity, which is how, how well we characterize the optimal mechanism. So for one item, it's completely closed form with Meyerson. And when we get to two items, we still don't have any characterization. For FedEx, an explicit dual is given. And the explicit dual is closed form, and it gives back a closed form uh, mechanism. For both budgets and what we do in single minded, um, the way that we characterize the optimal mechanism is that we say, suppose you were handed an optimal dual. It must have these specific properties attached to the dual. Otherwise, I could run some I could run some operations to make the dual even better and it wasn't optimal in the first place. Therefore, I know it has to have these properties. And because it has these properties, then any primal that sat satisfies complementary slackness with it must also have properties. So I can tell you things about the optimal mechanism, such as its many complexity or other things. So we don't have a closed form for the mechanism, but we do know properties of the mechanism and the dual. So it's not as explicit as in the FedEx setting, but we still know a lot about the mechanism and the dual. When you get to the multi-unit pricing problem, which was studied by Devener, Hogpana, and Somas in EC17, uh, it's still open. We don't have a characterization for it, although they did shed some light on various properties. However, all of these settings, which lie in between, have this DMR, declining marginal revenue condition, implies that they're deterministic. So again, this is what DMR means. Um, under DMR, they all go from you know, exponential to uh, unbounded many complexity back down to deterministic, like in the Meyerson case, like in the single item case. So that's a very interesting property of all these problems that lie in between. So I still think there's a lot less to study. There's a lot more questions in terms of what's the many complexity for mechanisms that have approximation guarantees. What about multiple buyers? What about other metrics like sample complexity or how many additional buyers you have to add? What about other models and objectives like two-sided markets, optimizing gains from trade, residual surplus? Um, I think there's a lot left to do in this regime and I'm excited to see people work on it. So thank you.